Hello everyone and welcome to Kerbal Space Program episode 8 of SSTO Space Program. Today we have an unusual mission ahead of us. As you remember last time we sent our first permanent man outpost consisting of a habitat and a greenhouse dome, but those two domes are not connected. This made the greenhouse dome inoperable and therefore our Moonor team is not producing any new supplies. We need to fix that as soon as possible as the habitat needs these supplies badly. We need to connect the domes together and for that we need to send in some construction vehicles and we also might want to start getting ready for mining operations. Therefore we will be sending a number of vehicles to our Moonar base and a tunnel with an airlock to connect our two domes together. First we need something to move one of the domes and for that I designed this spider-like looking lifter that can drive over a large dome and move it around. Since on the moon the gravity is very low, we need something very stable to make sure we have a decent level of control over the vehicle. And uh, KSP does like to behave in a strange way when it comes to cranes. At least that's my view of things, I've never operated an actual crane, but I sure did see one. This vehicle is too large to fit into the cargo bay and therefore we'll be sending it on top of a rocket, using a very similar mission design as we used for the domes themselves. I tried making the legs foldable using infernal robotics, but since we need to lift at least 40 tons with it and the center of mass is actually very far from the wheels, it was way too unstable to be reliable. I tried both stock docking ports and infernal robotics joints, but none of them really worked, and it seemed easier to just make the whole thing rigid and slap it on top of one of our trusty SSTO rocket lifters. The launch vehicle has usual parameters for this type of lifter that I use, with initial thrust to weight ratio of 1.2 and total payload capacity to low curb in orbit of around 10% of its maximum takeoff mass. The dome lifter crane weighs only about 20 tons but can lift more than twice its mass. Uh, we also have a transfer rocket that will take us to the moon and back, as well as a lander that we'll use to land obviously our crane on the surface of the moon. For the lander stage, this time I used three terrier engines as they provide enough thrust gimbal and have high enough efficiency to ensure we have over 1700 meters per second delta V in the lander stage for any necessary corrections we might want to make during our landing. Uh, the transfer rocket has the usual 1500 meters per second delta V needed to take us to the moon, perform an insertion burn round the moon and once we docked our lander back, a transfer burn back to Kerbin. As last time we will be coming back lighter, so we have uh, some excess fuel in this stage and we don't need to worry about efficiency that much. Once the transfer rocket with the lander and our dome lift are separated, the launch vehicle was ready to be deorbited and landed back at the KSC. This time I didn't forget to add reaction wheels and RCS to it, so we had full control over it while in space. I've also decided to use regular heat shields instead of the usual inflatable ones to improve the aerodynamics and be able to fly this thing in a semi-controlled manner. As you can see, it turned out pretty well and we've landed very close to KSC, which is important as we'll be recovering most of the funds invested in this vessel. Now we move to the key point of our mission. Apart from the dome lifter crane, we need to send in a regular crane, a cargo truck, a tunnel with an extra airlock, and while we're at it, I thought we might want to send a surveyor over as well. This is a problem in itself. All of that is going to be heavy, that's one thing, 40 ton of payload to be precise, but also almost none of it will fit into the Mark III cargo bay. We could have obviously sent three Hercules class SSTOs to the moon, each carrying one component and probably one Andromeda dropship as well, but that would be, well, a bit boring and obviously tedious. Plus, I'm constantly facing the problem of sending payloads that don't fit into the cargo bay, so I thought it's a perfect opportunity to deal with this issue once and for all. Meet Charon. The beast you see right now offers some solution to this problem. It uses fairings instead of a cargo bay, so it has vastly improved aerodynamics over SSTOs like Hercules and Titan, where payloads hang under the hull, and it's also powerful enough to carry everything in one go, so we don't need to worry about multiple launches. It is a bit of overkill, I'll admit that, but I wanted to try it out as a proof of concept as well. It has excess fuel and oxidizer, is capable of moon and tuna landings and return without refueling, and can land and take off in VTOL mode on two vector engines once you get to your destination. 
If you'd like to see how it was built, there is a speed build video available for this vessel. The appropriate card should be visible on your screen right now. As for stats, it has 40 ton payload capacity to Moon or Duna, maximum takeoff weight is 1100 tons, and it uses 22 Nerve rocket motors, 8 turbo ramjets and 48 rapier engines. This SSTO has a very decent thrust to weight ratio while in the atmosphere, so the initial ascent is relatively easy. Well, apart from the extremely low frame rate that you will be getting. Uh, the ship itself has over 600 parts and with the vehicles that we are carrying it went up a couple hundreds more. I was getting between 5 to 8 while flying it and the reason why it looks better in the video is because of the video editing magic. Uh, getting into orbit nevertheless was relatively easy but the ship is uh, initially quite nose heavy and becomes unstable as the fuel burns out. Something to watch out for if you want to give it a try yourself. Anyway, we made it into orbit and now it's time to deploy the fairing, revealing our payload for this mission. As I mentioned, we have a regular crane inside that we'll use to lift smaller components, a cargo truck with construction ports provided by the construction mod, an unmanned surveyor rover and a tunnel with an airlock. I'll explain later how all of this is going to be used together to establish a connection between our domes, but right now, with both our vehicles in the orbit, it's time to perform a transfer burn to the moon. For the rocket, with the dome lifts a crane, it was not a big deal, as rockets tend to have much higher thrust to weight ratio than nuclear powered SSTOs, and the burn was executed in just one pass. Our car on SSTO has initially around 0.19 thrust to weight ratio in nuclear mode, once it reaches the orbit that is, which is enough to execute the transfer burn in just two passes. It is also enough to land on the moon if needed, but uh, thanks to the excess oxidizer we have, we can improve the landing efficiency using short rapier and vector bursts. The burns for both our vehicles were really standard and everything went according to plan, so instead of filling you with all the boring details about the transmunar injection and insertion, I wanted to talk to you about something else that happened. As you remember, we have Outer Planet mods installed, and since recently I've also added Xen's Planet Pack as well. Those of you who follow me on Twitter might have noticed that I was working on a visual overhaul for those two mods. As far as I'm aware, there is no working visual overhaul for OPM, and Xen's Planet collection never had one. Well, I made my own Scatra and Cloud configs for all of the planets in question, as well as added patches for Planet Shine and Distant Object Enhancement. I am not an expert in planetary creation, but I think it turned out okay. Uh, I'm especially proud of Tector, a titan analog of planet Cernus. But, and there is always a but in KSP, I also realized that my FPS was going down consistently, especially for larger vessels. It wasn't as much of a problem for small SSTOs that we've been using so far, but crafts like Andromeda and Artemis were actually suffering from very low FPS, especially outside of Kerbin, on the moon's surface for example. I did some investigation trying to figure out what non-essential mods I can remove to liberate some memory and it turned out that the whole FPS issue was caused by Copernicus itself. The mere fact of having Copernicus installed, even without OPM or Xen Planets pack, kills my FPS. This is an actual problem we need to address as our bases and ships continue to grow. Right now, however, our dome lifter crane arrived to the moon and after executing a standard insertion burn, we entered a prograde orbit around it. Our outpost is conveniently placed in northwest crater, just slightly north of equator, which makes landings easy. After the landing stage separated, our three terrier engines were activated and we were ready to plot a landing trajectory. The thrust to weight ratio on the lander is pretty decent and it also has way too much fuel for this mission so we can freely adjust the course while we descend making sure that our touchdown will be as close as possible to the outpost. The crane itself is powered by fuel cells and small Oscar B tanks, it uses parts from the construction mod by Rover Dude for the mainframe as well as infernal robotics for the arm and stock claw for grabbing objects. The claw is a very useful part that allows grabbing any other vessel or part without the need for a docking port, but it's also very buggy. Once we've landed, the two vessels were separated and I moved the dome lifter out of the way. We'll come back to it shortly. Right now, however, it's time to send our lander back into orbit to rendezvous with the transfer stage. We have more than enough fuel to do so, as I said, and our landing was also much more efficient than the last time with the domes, because we had more engines. Having a gimbaled engine helps a great deal as well. 
Upon reaching the orbit, we still had around 20% of the fuel left in the lander stage, and after performing a standard encounter using an eccentric orbit transfer, the two vessels were docked together and were waiting to be sent back to Kerbin. Once we were done with the rocket, our cargo SSTO arrived to the moon and was ready to execute the insertion burn. With such a massive vessel and relatively low thrust to weight ratio it has, executing insertion burns takes much longer time. Once our orbit was established, we could plan our landing trajectory. Landing SSTOs, especially SSTOs this size, is usually a bit more difficult than landing your standard high thrust landers. This is simply because the time needed to cancel out the orbital velocity is significantly longer, and once you have to fight the gravity as well, the efficiency of your engine is lowered significantly. If you don't care that much where you will land and you are aiming only for a specific biome, this becomes a little bit simpler, but here we want to land within 2km distance from our base. In such case, using a maneuver node to figure out the burn time needed to slow down sufficiently to land at your destination will give you only a very rough estimate. This is because as soon as your retrograde vector starts pointing slightly towards the surface, you will be fighting gravity as well, and with the puny thrust nuclear engines can provide, it actually will change the burn time and therefore delta V needed to land. As you cannot really increase the thrust to weight ratio in nuclear mode, there is only a couple of ways to deal with the problem. You can either save some extra fuel for high thrust engines to help you wipe off the vertical velocity more efficiently, or actually find an optimal trajectory for your landing using mathematics, a little bit like a gravity turn but in reverse. Or quick save and quick load a lot. Nevertheless, we are getting ready for a touchdown and you can see me switching to VTOL mode and firing up the vectors. The large gimbal helped stabilize the vessel and actually made the landing almost easy. And we've landed. Time to unload our vehicles, starting with the mining rover and the crane. The rover is just partly useful as it can provide some data about the minerals in the area, but it's actually more of a prop I wanted to use in a future story video related to this mission. That's a spoiler, I guess. The crane, however, is a very important vehicle, again built using parts provided by the construction mod and infernal robotics and a claw for grabbing objects. We will use it first to help us unload the tunnel and to actually move smaller pieces around. We also have a cargo truck, this one is stock, safe for the construction port it carries and a small kiss container with the tools. Every vehicle that I brought here has a probe core and can be operated autonomously, but it looks so much cooler when the Kerbals are driving them. I've also decided to go for fuel cells this time as the main power source for those vehicles. I usually don't do that as I prefer to rely upon renewable resources, but I thought that here it might be a nice change. Plus we are going to be independent from the sunlight as long as we have fuel. Refueling our vehicles using Kerbal Attachment System is going to be easy and with long lunar nights being independent from the sunlight might be just what we need. All vehicles are out and manned by our brave Kerbonauts and now comes the risky bit, unloading the tunnel. The tunnel is actually very fragile and if dropped directly on the ground it would explode. Well, in KSP everything explodes, so that's not surprising. But to avoid unnecessary explosions, we will use our crane to lower it as gently as possible on the ground and move it away from our spaceship. As I said, I am no expert in operating cranes, but I did take a look how real cranes are made and this design you see right here is somewhat inspired by what I found out. I've also bound a bunch of keys to uh, internal robotic servos to help me control the crane without using the GUI all the time. I think it's more efficient this way and also looks better. The crane has stabilizers that come with the construction mod, but they have absolutely zero grip on the surface and once deployed the whole crane was sliding down the hill, so I never actually used them. Fortunately the crane was stable enough on the wheels only and we managed to unload the tunnel without breaking it. After some quick rearranging of the grip for more stable transportation, I sent our vehicles back to our base to begin the construction work. First was the cargo truck carrying four construction ports and a toolbox. Those construction ports are actually very interesting and useful parts. They act as docking ports, but they don't dock to stock docking ports and uh, only to other ports of their type. Once docked, you can compress them, creating a rigid joint between two previously docked parts. We will use them to connect one of the domes with a tunnel. We can of course attach lighter objects directly using Kerbal Attachment System, and I think for the tunnels and airlocks this is going to be enough. 
but moving 40 ton dome this way would be very difficult and we don't have enough kerbals. This is where our dome lifter crane rolls in. This vehicle is designed in such a way that it can easily lift the large domes we currently have and also ones that we might want to bring in in the future and move them around while being very stable. It's not extremely fast, but it doesn't need to be. It's not like we're going to drive for miles with them. The lifting arm has some rotation capabilities, as I anticipated that getting perfect alignment with it might be a little bit tricky. Well, we'll see how it turns out. Once the dome was more or less in place, the crane with the tunnel moved in and it was placed on the ground. The tunnel and the airlock are light enough that a bunch of kerbals can actually lift them and attach them directly using kerbal attachment system, so there is no need to use construction ports. I started with detaching the tunnel from the airlock and after repositioning the kerbals I attached the tunnel to the habitat dome. I wish there was actually a way of using cranes to emulate a larger number of kerbals because the way it works right now, as I understand it, all kerbals need to be very close to the object you want to lift in order to help you lift it and you can only move it a very small distance. Well, nevertheless, we managed to screw the tunnel to the airlock eventually and uh, the next step was to lift the whole thing up using our crane to attach a construction port to it. As you can see, the crane lifted the whole thing just barely, but high enough to safely attach a construction port to the tunnel. I moved the cargo truck slightly closer to the tunnel and sent Bill to unscrew one of the construction ports. After a little bit of moving it around, I managed to attach it to the tunnel Maybe I'm doing something wrong with the KES, but as, as I understand it, there is no other way of moving large but light objects with it. Kerbals now have some sort of KES inventory with limited volume and large parts don't fit inside, but at the same time, you're unable to walk while you're carrying a part. So the only way to move it is by placing it on the ground ever closer to your final destination. Once the ports were attached to the tunnel and the airlock of the greenhouse dome, I moved our kerbals out of the way and proceeded with docking the dome to the tunnel. It was surprisingly easy to do, at least comparing with my past experiences with surface docked bases, and we could compress the ports creating a permanent connection between our two domes. During the whole construction process there was one mod that I've installed recently that has proven to be extremely useful, called Easy Vessel Switch. It allows you to switch to another vessel simply by alt-left clicking on it and completely removes the randomness the stock system introduced. In situations like this one, where we have multiple objects within 2km range, and without the mod I was constantly switching from a vessel in the construction site to either the Surveyor Rover or the SSTO that brought us here. Bottom line is, it's a very useful mod and I highly recommend it. Right now, however, we need to place an extra airlock somewhere as there is no way to leave or enter our base. I guess Jeb doesn't mind as he can stay inside for about 36 years with the current supplies level, but it would be great to be able to get in or out nevertheless. So I used our crane to move the remaining airlock to the other side and with the help of three strong kerbals our new base entrance was established. Once this was done, this construction phase of our Munar base was officially complete. It turned out that most of the stuff I had was already on some kind of mission, either sitting in our space station or here in the surface outpost, and I was running short on pilots, scientists and engineers. Since for the time being pilots seemed to be very important, I did some crew shuffling and Jeb and Val entered the Malamute rover that would take them to the Caron and back to Kerbin, while the rest of our crew was for the moment left here on the surface of the moon. Looking at this takeoff, you can clearly see that Jeb is piloting this vessel, but I really trust his ability to pilot massive ships like this one. We had some excess oxidizer and, as usual, a lot of extra fuel, so reaching orbit was not a problem. The ship, now so much lighter, actually handled really well. It has lots of powerful reaction wheels and the RCS thrusters that help with controlling it. As a closing thought, I think that we have proven that an SSTO with fairings can be a viable option, and a really massive one too. From the practical point of view, however, it's not a vessel that I want to fly anytime soon. Not because it's unusually difficult to pilot, but that's also a potential issue. The real problem is that KSP doesn't handle large crafts very well, and it's just not practical because of that. As a solution to this problem, we might use tweak scale to make engines and intakes larger, that would reduce the part count significantly, or simply make an orbit-capable SSTO that uses fairings and build a freighter to take us deeper into space. 
One last challenge we had with this ship was landing and re-entry. We had a lot of excess fuel upon arrival to Kerbin and that was a good thing, since this SSTO does become unstable once it's empty. Also, it has a relatively small wing area and even if the remaining fuel is pumped to the very front of the vessel, it will still be unstable in the upper parts of the atmosphere. Well, after some intense fuel pumping, I was able to re-enter it in a semi-controlled manner and uh, land the ship back at the runway. The mission was a success. We were left only with bringing dome lifter crane rocket back to Kerbin. This was very easy, as with all the fuel left from the transfer and lander stages, we had almost 1000 meters per second delta V extra, so we had the comfort of getting into an orbit around Kerbin and deorbiting the rocket at the most convenient moment. It all went really well and we landed next to KC. So thank you very much for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and if you did please consider liking it and if you have any questions please leave them in the comment section below, I'll try to answer them the best I can. I'm Mark Frim and I'll see you next time, cheers!